Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson, and today I have the great pleasure of talking with Simon Hunt. Now, Simon Hunt is an economist. He's also one of the foremost experts in the copper industry. He's spent over 50 years in the copper industry, currently residing in Dubai. Uh, he is a Yorkshireman by background, so he tells it like it is. But one of the things that he has is a very strong outlook on the uh, global economy, what's going on, the trillions of dollars in debt that is out there. There is a good chance that this unserviceable debt will go into default. Simon also says that 2025 is going to be a very interesting time for the world, for the economy. So I've asked Simon to come on and give us an outlook and his views on what's going on out there. We're going to talk about all sorts of things. So sit up, get yourself a cup of tea, and uh, let's have a chat. Simon, thank you so much for joining me here on Small I would say not a cup of tea, I'd say a glass of whiskey. Oh, well done. He's a Yorkshire. There you go. Told you, lazy. He's a Yorkshireman. Tells it how it is. Bit early for whiskey. I'm not a whiskey girl. I'm a I'm a wine or a champagne, but yes, well, a thing. good whiskey. Um, Simon, let's start off um, because this is the first time you and I have had a chat. Um, tell me why you're in Dubai. Well, I came here by accident. I got so fed up with all the restrictions in the UK in December 2020. I needed a three-week holiday on two conditions, hot weather and where I could play tennis. So I went on to the Marriott uh, website and saw this lovely-looking place, a uh, resort in a place I'd never heard of before called Fujera, which is a province of the UAE. So having been there for a week, dear Boris Johnson locked everybody out. And uh, I then asked myself, do I really want to go back to the UK? I said, no. So here I am in Dubai. Well, it's definitely hot and they do like tennis over there. But Simon, I've been um, having a look at some of your thoughts recently and you've got some fairly strong views on where we are at the moment. And right now, I'm all I'm seeing is a lot of confusion from our audience out there as to, I guess, how to protect their wealth. But also, what what the heck is going on? So, what is the question? <laughs> what's get, what's going on with the world economy right now? You said we have unserviceable levels of debt that we could go into default. Do you think that's possible, or will they just keep printing and kicking the can down the road? No, uh, um, it, it, it is a most likely outcome. In fact, um, what we have is um, the end of last year, total global debt was 390 odd trillion trillion dollars versus a GDP last year of 102 trillion. Uh, we have had um, a decade of in real terms, basically negative interest rates. What does that do? It uh, creates a lot of speculation. Um, it creates greed. Mm. And now with uh, the Fed followed by other Western central banks, having decided that they really had made very big mistakes <clears throat> and they better do something about bringing interest rates up to a real level. Problem is that as, as we have seen in a highly leveraged system, when you go from rates basically, real rates basically zero to nominal rates at three, four percent, and in some cases where you're in 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 uh, sectors like the construction industry, you're probably paying seven to eight percent. All of a sudden, what you felt was <clears throat> was going to be zero rates forever no longer exists, mm. and that causes huge issues. And the second issue is that the banks um, from 2020 onwards loaded themselves with this 
supposedly safe stuff, uh, government bonds yielding practically nothing. And now the government bonds are yielding something and the prices have gone down. Mm. So globally, something like 800, 850 billion. Uh, if the prices were marked to market, the banks would have lost that amount of money. So you've got a highly fragile global system. And the question is, um, the real question is where are rates going to go? Because that's, is going to determine everything um, when the next round of bank failures and uh, uh, credit crises are going to occur. Well, we we think that probably ten-year treasuries are yielding something like, can't be exact figure, something like three point two, three point three. It will probably be yielding five percent by the middle of this year. So that, that's not in the market. The market is saying, oh, yields are falling. Great. But this is rare view forecasting. It's right. not looking not looking at where the car is traveling down the road. Mm. So 5% is going to cause, and that should happen around the middle of the year, that's going to cause the next wave of crises quite what they're going to be, who knows? But there's no question, there'll be crises. <clears throat> so with rates rising and actually real money supply, which had a pickup in the first quarter, has, is now going negative again. And that tells you something that, uh, where is global business going to go? It's going to go downhill. Negative real, negative real money supply and rising interest rates is going to lead into a recession. And in the United States, people point towards um, the strong employment data, but actually, if you look at the forward indicators, it's it's it's, it's got very weak. So. Um, Recession is going to be around the corner. Um, at the same time, around the middle of the year, the war in the Ukraine will intensify with a big, big risk that it actually goes over the borders of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think this is a huge risk. Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, growing in this part of the world, um, growing tensions between Israel and Iran, nothing new, but Iran has stated that they've got enriched uranium to over 90%, which brings them close to having a bomb. Mm. You've got huge domestic problems, political problems in Iran. The United States and um, Israel have been conducting um, simulation attacks on Iran. Now, that was a month or so ago. So I, I think, I mean, this is not a forecast. It's one of the risks that we have to watch very carefully. There's a big, big risk that um, Israel will attack Iran. Mm. The problem is that Iran is fully prepared for this. They have acquired the latest anti-ship missiles from uh, Russia and China. According to my local sources, they have actually chosen the two super tankers to sink in the narrow part of the channel to prevent any shipping going in or out. Wow. And if that, I mean, this is a risk. It's not a forecast. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Something we have to watch carefully. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if that happens, you're going to blow up the global derivative market. Why does that blow up that, the global derivative market? And if that market? does happen, think, mm -hmm. think of the strategic alliances that Iran has developed with 
China and Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you attack Iran, you are attacking China and Russia. There, there seems to me, because uh, uh, this leads into sort of the BRICS and the BRICS plus nations, there seems to, to, to me that there's a shift away from US dollar as a reserve currency and that, you know, you mentioned in Iran, you're attacking China and Russia. Well, there's a group of countries getting together from the looks of it to say, we've had enough and maybe the distraction is war but the ultimate result is a complete reworking of the global economy. Correct. How how much do you think that, that, that that's a possibility? I would like to say 100%, but nothing is 100%, but put the odds at, say, 90%. It's happening. It's evolving. People are not recognising it. Uh, you, you've um, you've had the Iranian president in 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 Moscow. You've had the rapprochement uh, orchestrated by Beijing between Saudi and Iran. Uh, you've got um, Assad from Syria being brought into the the Arab fold again. Uh, you've got Qatar is being brought in as well. Um, Turkey is being brought in. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, behind the scenes, there is an awful lot going on. Um, as I mentioned to you before you started recording, that the president this year of BRICS is the president of South Africa. So don't tell me that some African countries are not going to join BRICS. Um, uh, we know that um, the Gulf countries have indicated a willingness to join. Um, you've got uh, Lulu back as president of Brazil. Uh, he is a very active, always has been a very active supporter of BRICS. You have the ex-finance minister of Brazil, now is the uh, president of the BRICS Development Bank. Um, you have India and Russia doing huge oil and other trade deals together without the dollar. Mm -hmm. By the way... Uh, the UAE currency, the dirham, has been used in that in those transactions. Um, you have had Saudi Arabia selling a tanker or two of oil to China, receiving RMB. What did they do with the RMB? They bought gold on the uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange. Yeah. You had the UAE selling 65, no, 62,000 tons of LNG to China, receiving RMB. What they did with the RMB, I don't know, but I would guess the same thing. Mm -hmm. Buy gold through the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The big deal has been between Russia and China. Russia has a very large trade surplus with China uh, for the sale of energy and, and raw, other raw materials. What are they doing with the surplus? It's held in a gold differential account in the PBOC. And probably that is the template of um, what will happen between China and, and the GCC countries. So gold is has already come back as a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. And if you're going back to BRICS, the original plan drawn up by uh, the Russian economist who is in charge of developing the new currency, originally it was going to be a combination of the weighted average of member currencies and uh, the 
value of the commodities that members produce, but valued not in dollars, but in gold. Mm -hmm. But there are more recent indications that they're going to make it much simpler. The ruble and the yuan will be convertible into gold. Bang. Wow. Bang. What does that do for the US dollar? <laughs> I could answer in a very simple Yorkshire manner, but I no, don't know. Do. You're allowed to do that, Simon. <laughs> no. Um, by, say, 2026, 2027, the dollar index will have halved in value. Oof. Making it no longer, will it, will it still be the world's reserve currency? Or is this movement by the BRICS nations and the Russia's, the China's, et cetera, really making it a lot less relevant on the global stage? Uh, correct. Uh, neither Russia nor China want their currencies to be the reserve currency. No. Their whole philosophy is a multinational environment. So <clears throat> you will trade um, in, a con in, in a gold convertible currency, or you will trade within your own currencies without going through the dollar. Why go through the dollar? Mm. I mean, interestingly, what's Ghana done? Ghana has a lot of gold and Ghana needs to import. So instead of having to build a dollar reserve to pay for its oil imports, if you want, we want oil, we give you gold. Wow. So this is like a, I, I don't want to call it a virus, but it feels almost like it, it, like a virus, it's starting to spread. And I'm talking to you in April 2023. This is how, it feels like it's a snowball going down the hill, picking up speed rapidly. It is. Um, I mean, we've got built into our forecast that essentially the global financial system will collapse in 2025. That's a massive statement there, Simon. Um, when you say collapse, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, you'll have, by, by then you'll have long-term 10-year treasuries yielding over 10%. What is that going to do to a highly leveraged global financial system? Put it into default. Yeah, that leads to that. That's what will lead to depression. And in the depression, a the BRICS will come out with their new currency, and b uh, the Western countries will come up with a digital currency, mm -hmm. which is just as worthless because mm -hmm. it's a paper currency, but in digital form. Yeah. The rest of the world, because the BRICS countries, within five years, maybe within two years, the way the pace at which this is going, is really going to cover the bulk of the world's commodity markets. Right. Um, so if you turn on its head Secretary's, Treasury Secretary Connolly's remark decades ago, the dollar is your problem. The BRICS are now then going to say commodities are your problem. And you need them. Yeah. So those with the, mo <laughs> those with the mo most toys win. In other words... If you have commodities, now I'm talking to you from Australia, we have, we're a resource rich country. So are you saying that countries that are resource rich, that can pay for goods and services with resources will get through this global collapse? 
Well, except that the, the prices of the commodities are going to collapse too. Oh, okay. Oh, because yeah. I mean, if you take copper, uh, we've got a short-term correction down to about six thousand five hundred dollars, but with the by the autumn, with, with the Fed and other central banks looking at failures within the financial system, war over Ukraine intensifying, other hot spots, uh, the dollar starting to fall sharply. They're going to turn the credit taps full on. So you then get some economic recovery, but in a highly inflationary environment, um, and in an inflationary environment, what does manufacturing do? First of all, it replenishes the inventories of everything that they have uh, 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 sold off. And then as, a, as their own inflation hedge, instead of holding a ton of copper, they'll hold two tons of copper, for instance. And then you have the financial institutions. What do they do always when there is a falling dollar currency and rising inflation? They go long of commodities as their own hedges and long of equities. Your, your equity market will probably, by the autumn, will have fallen by something like 30%. But then the Fed opens the taps full on to get what I call the last hurrah in global equities and in commodities. We're basically from the lows of the autumn of this year they'll double by early 2025 or end of 2024. And then why why then? You, so so you, you, what you're saying is 2023, a pullback of about 30%. Then they open up the credit markets, they open up the floodgates, the QE starts all over again, there's money everywhere. Equity markets go up rapidly. But then you're saying there'll be a collapse. Yeah. Because you grab 10 year treasuries yielding over 10% and all other government bonds yielding comparable figures. What does that do to your highly leveraged system? Collapses. Mm. What's happened when treasuries were yielding 3%? Huh? We had a know. major crisis. We had a major crisis in America, which yep. the authorities moved very rapidly to stop any systemic risk. Of course, yeah. But but come on, you go to ten percent. So, if I can go back a step, going back to BRICS, I mean, there, there's an awful lot going on here. But one of the things that appears to me to be uh, a constant around the BRICS is gold. So if one was to assume that this new BRICS economy, which is a, a lot of countries are involved now, and if they're going to be doing their trade in gold, it, it, it appears to me that the potential for gold, where others are collapsing, gold will be the place to be. Correct. And so if you were sitting listening to you now, our audience out there, would you be saying there's going to be an awful lot of turmoil, at least have some exposure to gold? Definitely. And I'm, so not say, I'm not saying buy today, because I think we could easily have a nice little correction over the next month or so. But on any correction, buy gold and hold it. Why do you think there'll be a, a correction in the near term? Uh, if interest rate goes up, it will shake people out. Mm -hmm. It's only short-term correction, but on a correction, you buy it. You recently also mentioned that you felt that interest rates were going to fall. After... 
interest rates will fall uh, um, in the fourth quarter. Of this year? Yeah, because we're in a recession and the central banks have opened the taps, blah, blah, blah. So probably we will see 10-year treasuries, which will have got up to 5% by mid-year, going down to 3.5%. But then by, certainly by early 2025, if not the end of 2024, they'd have shot up to over 10%. Which will hurt. Falling, falling dollar, crashing dollar, uh, rising inflation, Inflation probably worse than what it was in 1981. Wow. You then had US CPI from memory at 13.5%. You've got, you've had in the last five years, the amount of credit that global central banks have pushed into the economy was the equivalent of the an annual equivalent of 47% of GDP or something like from memory 43 trillion dollars so that that goes into every nook and can, canny cranny in the global economy so and I mean, then, I then and then we are going to have uh supply disruptions on oil Mm -hmm. So you will see oil by the end of 2024, call it $150. But the big kicker is going to be food prices for weather-related reasons, other than the usual reasons of supply disruptions out of Russia, Ukraine, and fertilizer shortages. But the game changer, we're going to either by the end of this year or next year, move into what's called the 89-year Glesberg mm -hmm. weather cycle. Mm -hmm. And 89 years ago, that caused the, the Dust Midwest Bowl. Dust Bowl decade. Yeah. And that, that was a terrible time. And, you know, I think if people can put up with a lot of things, but if they're hungry, you're going to get a lot of social unrest. Correct. Do you see that? is coming as well, social unrest generally. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm pretty sure of it. I, I'm sure of it because we've had all this left-wing socialism uh, instilled into virtually most governments in the Western world. And there's going to come a point when the population is going to rebel. Mm-hmm. They're going to say, particularly with all this ESG nonsense about uh, CO2 emissions causing warming weather. Uh, but the real weather patterns are long-term weather patterns. And if you go back to what NOAA and NASA said in September 2020, we are coming out of a 40-odd year warming uh, uh, warming years and by 2027 2028 we're moving into a cooling period yep in fact noah actually says a full-blown minima period mm. i.e gold mm. so people are going to say why are we spending all this money on having evs and doing all of this stuff on heating homes and cooling homes no, thank you. Well, they will rebel. So the rebellion comes because cost of living and because they see the governments actually pull the wool over their eyes. Do you think they'll wake up in time? I think they'll wake up. <laughs> I can't answer whether it's going to be in time. Right. Well, speaking of time, uh, Simon, I, I'd love to have you back on again soon because we've, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. But I would like to know, we have a big audience out there, we're here in Australia, but, you know, we have audience all over the world. 
as I talk to you now in April 2023, I often say to people, be prepared, not scared. What are three things that you would say to people as to what they could do to be a little bit more prepared, a little bit more awake as we head into the changes? I think the the the, the big message that I'm trying to give to not just my clients, but I was in Santiago, Chile, um, got back the early hours of Wednesday morning, trying to tell the guys there, um, now is the time you should start contingency planning. Don't wait until the proverbial hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Start now. So for my personal, from you know, household's point of view, start saving a little bit more, um, have a nice stock of food, uh, buy gold on weekdays, et cetera, et cetera, all the sensible things. Um, and buy gold on weekdays, he doesn't mean not on weekends. He means... No, no, I mean, when, when you see the price falling... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, probably the, over the weekend, you couldn't be able to buy gold anyway. <laughs> when it comes to gold, though, Simon, do you do you say when you buy gold, not paper? You mean no, you must gold. buy physical gold. Right. The paper gold market will be blown up. Okay. Why? Because there will come a point when the banks are over, overrun by the physical market. Who owns the physical market? In gold? It's, not, it's the central banks? No. Oh. Bricks. Plus. Bricks plus. When you, when you say Bricks plus, what does that mean? I know Bricks, which is Brazil, Russia. Yeah, I always call it Bricks plus because they're continually getting new members. Uh, on that note, sorry, I said we're running out of time. I just want to ask you, if BRICS Plus becomes as big, as important as it potentially could and they're backing things by gold, does that mean that places like NATO, World Health Organization, they, they tend to lose their power? Uh, they will disappear. Wow. There's a very interesting... Um, um, the Russian economist who's developing the, the new currency did an extremely good interview a few months ago. And one of the clauses in the new currency is that if an existing member or a new incoming member defaults on its loans to the Western world, either to individual banks or to World Bank, IMF, etc., they will not be debarred from joining BRICS. What does that tell you? If you're an indebted country that you're going to join BRICS, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Nice. Thanks for the party. On to the next. Well, it's one way of putting it. Simon, uh, I think we're in for some pretty challenging times. Um, yes. I'm sure you're not going back to the UK anytime soon. No. Uh, can people follow you on Twitter? They can follow me on my website and from the website is simon-hunt.com. Right. So if they'd like to follow some of what you're saying and get some more information, that's the best yeah, place. Absolutely. All right, sir. Well, listen, I appreciate it because I know you've just got back from Chile. We haven't even gone into some of those areas. But, uh, Simon, please come back and have a chat again with me sometime soon. Okay. Uh, Happy to. Really enjoyed chatting today. Thanks so much. Likewise. Cheers. Bye.